evening, everyone, uh, and welcome um, to the 15th annual David Dinkins Leadership and Public Policy Forum. Uh, my name is Robert Lieberman. I'm the Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs here at Columbia. And on behalf of SEPA and Columbia University, I want to welcome you all uh, to our forum. Uh, and my job was supposed to be to uh, welcome you all briefly and introduce Mayor Dinkins. Unfortunately, the mayor uh, is not going to be able to be with us tonight. Uh, for health reasons. He's all right um, and uh, wanted uh, to convey his best wishes to everyone and a special thanks to, um, to our guests for being here. Um, so I'm going to uh, step into his role. Uh, he cannot be replaced, but I'm going to step into his role for tonight um, and, uh, and introduce our uh, uh, keynote speaker. As you know, the Dinkins Forum every year um, focuses on uh, a set of important challenges facing um, urban America. Uh, and this year, um, our focus, our announced focus at any rate, um, has, is, was going to be or is the, um, the latest um, and also the, one of the oldest uh, continuing battles on the forefront of uh, the struggle for civil rights and racial equality in the United States, and that is voting rights. Um, we're fortunate, uh, really fortunate, to have a large group of uh, colleagues, scholars, friends uh, of SEPA and Columbia University who are able to help us think through some of the important issues in uh, voting rights um, and voter suppression tonight. Um, and we'll have a chance later on in the evening to hear from uh, a group of um, extraordinary colleagues, friends of mine, friends of SEPA, uh, colleagues here at Columbia, um, and in the lar broader, larger New York City area um, who will be able to help us uh, uh, talk about uh, and think about some of these vital issues. Um, so let me just recognize them. You'll hear more about them um, in, a, in a minute. Uh, my colleagues um, in SEPA and the Political Science Department, Professors Rudy De La Garza, uh, Fred Harris, and Dorian Warren um, will be joined by Ted Shaw from the Law School. Um, and we're very pleased uh, to welcome to Columbia Eleanor Tatum, uh, the publisher and editor-in-chief of the Amsterdam News, the oldest, oldest and largest newspaper uh, serving the African-American community uh, here in New York City. Um, I'll also say a few words right now of introduction to um, Esther Fuchs, uh, who was um, one of our impresarios for the evening. Um, Esther is a colleague here at SEPA, uh, a professor of public affairs and political science here at Columbia. Um, and really um, one of, the, uh, one of the, the guiding lights, one of my guiding lights um, here, at, uh, here at Columbia, a leading scholar of um, urban policy and politics, um, and someone who practices what she preaches. She uh, spent four years um, working in city government uh, for Mayor Bloomberg as his special advisor for governance and strategic planning, and we were very lucky that we were able to lure her back to uh, Columbia where she's been able to trade on the wisdom that she gained um, actually working in, uh, in public affairs and government um, um, uh, to come back to SEPA as a, as a faculty member. Um, so we'll call on Esther uh, later on in the proceedings to introduce and moderate our panel. Um, um, uh, but before the panel, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, spend a minute or two introducing our uh, keynote speaker uh, for tonight. Um, uh, and that is uh, Benjamin Todd Jealous. Ben Jealous um, is, as you all know, the, um, the uh, president and CEO of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, an organization that for a little more than 100 years has really been at the forefront of the struggle for equality, um, for uh, what we might call the democratization of American politics and the broader inclusion um, of uh, uh, the broader inclusiveness of American politics and American society. Um, ben Jealous is a graduate of Columbia College. Um, he was on the, what, seven or eight year plan here at Columbia. Um, he entered Columbia as a member of the class of 1994, um, took a sort of meandering course uh, through his studies here at Columbia College, um, uh, graduated and was named a Rhodes Scholar, um, spent a couple of years at Oxford, and since then has had an extraordinarily uh, distinguished and sort of meteoric career um, in, uh, in journalism, in social activism, 
in, uh, in, in organization. Um, he's worked uh, um, as a journalist in the South. Um, he uh, spent some time as the director of, U of the U.S. Human Rights Program at Amnesty International. Um, he was the president of the Rosenberg Foundation, um, a, 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 an organization that funds um, civil rights and, and human rights advocacy, especially focused on, on uh, Ben's native state of California. Um, and in 2008, as I said, was appointed the 17th president and chief executive officer of the NAACP, becoming the youngest person to hold that position um, in the more than 100 year history of, of the NAACP. <laughs> Since taking the helm at the NAACP, he's driven the organization's engine to accelerate a number of its important programs, um, advocating for health care as a civil right, uh, for the strengthening of hate crimes enforcement, um, the protection of rights of the working poor, um, combating employment discrimination. He's taken on and he's helped the organization to, to um, organize itself to take on a, a series of what have become the most pressing and urgent issues in urban America and facing uh, minority communities in American politics. Um, he has, and, and at the NAACP, he's also been an extremely important voice and advocate for um, something that we all thought, hoped, prayed was a, more or less a settled issue um, in the last 40 years since the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and that is minority voting rights in the United States. Um, as we've seen uh, voting rights issues unfold over the last couple of years and couple of decades, um, we observe that this is no longer, this is not a settled issue. And in fact, once again, voting rights is at the cutting edge, at the leading edge of uh, the struggle for racial equality um, and for equal citizenship and equal demo democratic citizenship in the United States. And Ben, uh, and his work at the NAACP has, has really been at the, at the right at the front of efforts um, to, to deal with that issue. He's also been um, um, quite eloquent and outspoken just in the last couple of weeks um, on another set of issues um, that have come and gone in, the, in American politics in the last few years, but have come back um, quite a bit in the last, uh, just, just in the last few days and weeks. Um, he's been especially outspoken in his uh, in his um, 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 uh, statements about um, about the the Trayvon Martin tra tragedy in Florida, and I hope we'll hear some words um, from Ben about that uh, tonight, if he can sort of weave that into the theme, which I'm fully confident that with his Columbia College education um, he can do um, as a matter of course. So it really gives me great pleasure, and it's a great honor to introduce to you the president of the NAACP, Ben Jealous. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Professor Fuchs. Thank you to Mayor Dinkins, who is a hero and who I was blessed to speak to earlier today uh, from his hospital bed. It's good to look out in this audience and see so many old friends and fellow travelers, uh, including Ms. Tatum of the Amsterdam News and, and especially Ted Shaw uh, this week. Um, Ted uh, is formerly the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and this week all of us are mourning the loss of John Payton, um, who left us suddenly last week. What I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to ultimately talk about how mass incarceration and voter suppression are linked. I'm going to talk, if you will, about the least controversial aspect of the suppression of the black vote in this country because it's the least talked about and the most en enduring. But before I get there, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story because it kind of frames how I approach my work, uh, in fact, why I do this work. I, earlier today, I saw Sunil Gulati, uh, professor of economics here at Columbia. I met him when I was a freshman and planning to work for Wall Street. That lasted like a semester. <laughs> um, but he and I have, re have remained friendly ever since, mostly because we both love soccer. But it was a reminder that my time here as a student at Columbia really grounded me and defined uh, my life to, to, uh, to date. And there was this night in 1993, 
was about 20 years old, and we were celebrating Friend's 21st birthday. We were over on uh, the steps of Low Library, and we were drinking, as at least 20 years ago, a 20-year-old might do, at Columbia University. And a round of toast went out. And the first one went out to our friend who was turning 21. And we all toasted him. And then the friend was sort of caught with a wave of sadness, and he poured libations of memory to all those we knew who had been shot, killed, before we even got to college. And then, I think, trying to turn the mood around, a friend held up his glass to toast the fact that one more of us had survived to 21. And I couldn't raise my glass on that last toast. In fact, it felt like the motion just cut me like a knife. The fact that a man of any race, of any age, in this country, the world's greatest and wealthiest democracy had had his expectations for any group of men, let alone his own, so reduced as to think it an accomplishment to simply survive past the age of 21, breathe, breathe a breath past the age of 21. Cut me like a knife. And so I stewed on it for a bit, and then I did quite honestly what I still do often when I'm stuck on a question. I went to my grandmother's table. My grandmother is a third generation member of the NAACP. She's 96 years old. The first in her line to join the NAACP was her grandfather, who was born a slave, died a state senator, and co-founded Virginia State along the way. Yeah, our family's kind of rolled downhill, actually, <laughs> since slavery, unlike, unlike most. <laughs> and, uh, and so I just put it on our table. I said, Grandma, what happened? You told me that we were supposed to be the first generation black people in this country to be judged not by the color of our skin or the kink of our hair or our family heritage or what side of Baltimore our family comes from, what housing projects my mom spent half her childhood in, but rather by the content of our character. And Grandma, you know, you told me that, that we would simply reap what you all had sown, that the movement for us was optional, that fighting was optional, because you all had killed Jim Crow, just like your parents and grandparents had killed his daddy. And we simply had to reap what you had sown. Keep our nose clean. Study hard. And you know, Grandma, that worked for many of us. It worked for me, but I dare say it didn't work for most of us. Because my generation is the most incarcerated generation on the planet and the most murdered in the country. And truth be told, while we've always been more incarcerated than our white peers, not like this before. Not like this. And my grandma looked at me, got real quiet. She said, son, it's sad, but it's simple. Our people got what they fought for, but they lost what they had. Got the right to be a police officer, lost safe communities. Got the right to work for a corporation, lost our own corporations, insurance companies, for example and so on and so forth. Well, in the job that I sit in, you have to be real focused. Focused at a level that I haven't quite achieved yet, to be honest. Because the reason I do my work is I sat there at my grandmother's table and I occurred to me in that moment that for four generations, from my grandmother's grandfather through my mom, who desegregated her high school in 1954, Western High School for Girls in Baltimore. It's a member of the NAACP. Children in our family, children of the NAACP were trained to fight. We were told we had no choice. That our purpose God put us on this planet was to make things better for the next generation. 
and that my generation had been told simply it was optional. And so in this job, if you really believe that if the NAACP does its work well, that things get better and better for millions of people, then you have to be extremely focused. And the question is, okay, well, what do we have? What is truly fundamental and foundational to what we have? And what are we fighting for? Well, what we are fighting for is always a version of freedom. We are fighting, you know, the problems facing black folks throughout our time on this planet, the biggest problems are the ones you can see from space. You can see the transatlantic slave trade from space. If we had satellites, boats going back and forth, plantations swelling. You can see chattel slavery from space, backs huddled together, picking cotton by hand, extremely labor intensive. You can see segregation from space. Masses of people in one neighborhood, all one color. And you can see prisons in this country, this country that in a world has seven million inmates and our country has two million. Well, you can see that from space too. You might not see it from New York City because they're upstate. Part of Governor Rockefeller's plan to keep folks employed. But you can see it from space. And so the fight for freedom in this country is always against that big rock that holds us back. Slavery, segregation, and these days, mass incarceration. Black men, five times more incarcerated than their white peers. People in this country, five times to be more likely to be incarcerated than their peers in the West. That is what we're fighting for. We are fighting for our freedom. What we have fundamentally as a people, as a community, is our power and ultimately our vote. Our right to vote, our ability to cast ballots, ability to access the great American promise of one person, one vote, that right is the right upon which our ability to defend all of our other rights is leveraged. We suppress the vote minimize the vote, shave off a little bit of the vote over here and a little bit over there, and the ability to defend everything else gets tougher. That's why the folks who are attacking affirmative action, attacking the rights of immigrants, attacking clean air and clean water regulations, attacking a woman's right to choose, attacking health care reform, and so on and so forth, are the same people who are funding, same people who are funding this massive legislative assault on the right to vote. The biggest, the biggest that we've seen in 100 years. In fact, they have one group, and that's a separate conversation, that literally Johnny Appleseed's all of those attacks, or most of them, called ALEC. And so, it is experienced in a country where 8% of the black vote is disenfranchised, 2 million people disenfranchised for being formally incarcerated. It is still the most effective. It is also one of the first, and when you look back at that history, you see how the two are connected. Here in New York State, great state, great anti-slavery tradition, liberal Republicans coming out of the Civil War, opposed the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Had already given black property owners the right to vote, simply didn't want all black folks to vote in New York. Had one of the largest free black populations and it would be of real consequence. After the 15th Amendment was passed over New York State's objection, they went right into Albany and sought to pass what would be one of the first of a sustained wave of ex-felon disenfranchisement bills after the Civil War. And said specifically in the legislative history, that they were doing so to similarly offset the black vote. Well, why would that work? Either black people commit crimes at a higher rate or they are simply more likely to be convicted. Racial profiling, in other words, becomes the foundational strategy for voter suppression. There are these waves, there are two sets of parallel waves in this issue, and I'll ask you to hold both in your mind because they kind of come one after the other, or right together. On the, on the one set, you have a wave 
about suppressing the vote. On the other side, you have a wave of increasing incarceration in the black community. Right after the Civil War, what happens with the, the vote? A wave, first the, the black vote expands, 15th Amendment, and then a wave that goes on for 40 years of voter suppression legislation. 1906, Virginia, long after New York had passed their law, seeks to encode their ex-felon incarceration bill into their state constitution. And in doing so, one of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention advocating for that amendment says, because of this plan, the darkie will be eliminated as a factor in our state's politics within five years. Very explicit. In our country, we expand access to the franchise for blacks. It is followed by voter suppression. It happened after the Civil War. It happened after the Voting Rights Act. It is happening now after the election of the first black president. Same time you have this, these waves, same sort of rhythm, you have these waves, you get rid of slavery, and they actually start to increase penalties for the crimes that the politicians of the, of the day most associate with blacks. We get rid of segregation, and the very argument for why you should be afraid of blacks, for why we should deny rights to blacks, for why we should shifts during segregation, it was essentially protecting white femininity. Segregation and apartheid is a foundational to both. This sort of myth of the hypersexual rapist black man is used to justify this racial wall in our society. You get rid of that and what comes right away, blacks are criminals and we have to protect our communities. And the incarceration rate of blacks versus whites, which stayed roughly from the end of the Civil War to, to the end of the Civil Rights Movement, twice that of whites starts steadily climbing to where it is now, about five times that of whites. And with that, racial profiling, again, becomes foundational. Becomes foundational. If you accept the principles of racial profiling, which is that we can actually tell criminals based on what they look like, but rather than on what they do, then you're in for the whole thing. Then you're in for the whole thing. Why do I raise this? I raise this because this year, what we have gone through, what is largely, what we have gone through, what is the biggest assault on voting rights, the most laws passed in a year since the rise of Jim Crow, states across the country, five million voters newly pushed out of the voting box. You know, we spent a long time talking about voter ID and how ridiculous that justification is. Right? I mean, literally, right? They pushed out five million people. According to the Republican Lawyers Association, maybe there's 25 people a year who impersonate a voter. And for this, they're pushing out five million people. You have a greater likelihood in your lifetime of getting struck with lightning and then getting struck with lightning again in the same place, mathematically, than to seeing somebody impersonate somebody else as a voter. Right? That's how ridiculous it is. We said, you know, similar to that is registration ID. Alongside that are their attacks on early voting, Sunday voting, same day registration. But what we don't talk about is that Rick Scott this year signed an executive order undoing what Jeb Bush and Charlie Crist had worked together to do before him and actually put back in place his state's ban on formerly incarcerated people voting. 500,000 voters pushed off the rolls, 250,000 of them black. We confront a Secretary of State and say, why are you doing this? Why are you doing you know what she says? She says, because it's very important. Why is it because it's, very, because it's imperative? Why is it so imperative? Because it's important. Why is it so important? Because it's imperative. Well, we go around like this, and eventually we're just like, all right, you just ain't going to tell us. And then you look at your history. Eliminate the darky as a factor in our state's politics in five years. And then you read further in that history, and they go on to talk about using the ex-felon ban in Virginia to maintain white supremacy in every county. Maybe it's the case that politicians today are just too shy to be so plain spoken. But it's absolutely the case that the impact that we had then, when blacks were roughly twice as likely as their white peers to be incarcerated, 
is the impact that we have now that's five times. One's five times. This means, and I think what Trayvon's, and I spent a week in Sanford, Florida, in a town that when you landed, I mean, and you have to understand, I've, I've lived a lot of my life as an organizer in places that feel like movie sets, right? Harlem in the early 90s felt like a movie set. Jackson, Mississippi, where the governor was trying to shut down a college so that he could turn it into a prison, felt like you were 50 years back in time. Our newspaper, last time it got burned down, was 1998. It was burned down just a couple years before I got there. But you land in Sanford last week on Sunday. I've never seen, I mean, it was like going into the, um, the set of In the Heat of the Night. It was the tensest place I've ever been in my life. You talk to the waitresses on the one side of town, they're, they're worried about a riot. You talk to the waitresses on the other side of town, they're worried about a race war. Both of them have reason to be afraid. Sit down uh, with the folks who know the community well, they say, just be very clear, the Klan is extremely active here. The police are deeply entrenched. And then you show up to a community meeting that was supposed to have maybe 500 people. There's 2,000. 1,500 can't even get inside. And the next, you know, at 10.30 at night, we said to folks, look, this community meeting it's going to have to come to an end. But if you have stories about how you've been mistreated by this police department, please come back tomorrow. Y'all, let's come back at noon tomorrow. So I sat down at noon in this church. I got 10 people lined up to tell their stories. I have 12 cameras in front of me. It occurs to me I don't know who any of these people are or what their story is going to be. And you know, I've got enough hearing to know that you better know who's going to testify and what their story is going to be. But we had made this promise to this community, and quite frankly, the biggest uh, uh, objective at the moment, besides getting rid of the police chief and you know help you know and getting information to DOJ to help with their in, investigation, is letting steam off this community. So you know we're going to take this risk. We're going to let these people talk in front of 12 rolling cameras. What emerges is two patterns. The first woman gets up and talks about how starts crying and talks about how her son was shot in the back, and then she was told that he was charging an officer in his car. And for two years, no one's been able to explain to her how that bullet got in his back if he was trying to run the man down the street. And then the next one gets up and tells a story of being humiliated in front of his friends at the Walmart, just being racially profiled by the cops as he was walking towards Walmart. And then the next one gets up and talks about her nephew, who two years ago was holding his eight-month-old and getting out of his car and robbers approach and he tried to defend himself and the baby and they shot him in the chest just inches from, his, from the, the skull of the baby. The bullet entered his chest and he ran to a neighbor to hand the baby to safety and then ran back to his car to try to get himself to the hospital because he didn't trust the EMS to come fast enough and he bled to death in the street. And by the end of it, having cried multiple times, I'm not a guy who cries easily, Two patterns emerge. One is this very deep pain of black men who have been murdered by bad cops, by thugs, and the police really didn't seem to care in either case. And a very broad pain of racial profiling. And it occurs to me, Sanford, Florida is really Sanford, USA. I could have held that hearing in any number of places across this country. And I'm coming here to New York City, where this mayor has made virtually a religion out of racial profile. Racial profiling that George Bush campaigned against in 1999 and 2000. The Ted and I thought was on the ropes 10 years ago and has come back after September 11th with a vengeance that, and here we have this, this group of young people in front of us, many of whom are about to vote for the first time and if they vote, it'll probably be on this issue. These kids are marching over Trayvon. They'll probably be on this issue. These kids who grew up in this city where there's virtually one stop and frisk for every black man between 1835 and New York City, will probably vote on this issue. But what they don't seem to really understand is that, and what they need to understand is that protecting their vote and ending racial profiling aren't 
It isn't one thing you do to achieve the other. It's actually the same thing. It's actually the same thing. And so if we're going to have an honest conversation about really getting to a place where our country truly is one person, one vote, then we, yes, we have to eviscerate voter ID because it's based on a complete fallacy and it's going to have a significant impact in blocking people. I've spent too, many times, too much time talking to 90-year-old like grandmothers who just simply cannot find their original birth certificate because they lost it and the county courthouse burned down and won't be able to vote again. To, to tell you that it really, you know, and to young people um, who have to keep that ID uh, where they're from to hold on to their financial aid, but they want to vote where they live, to tell you it's going to impact millions of people in ways that are profound. And we've got to stop registration ID, which is this crazy variant, which is basically intended to shut down voter registration drives. You won't have your voter registration form processed in Georgia or Arizona unless your ID is attached, right? You know, I try around this country. I say, raise your hand if you've ever participated in a voter registration drive. In NAACP room, it's like 80% of the room. I say, keep your hand up. If you've ever done that while pushing a Xerox machine down the street, no one's been able to keep their hand up. That's the whole point. And we've got to fight for early voting and same-day registration and hold on to Sunday voting, which they have targeted in Florida specifically the last Sunday before election. Because that was the Sunday when black churches pushed their people. They, they, they saw the same numbers that, that we saw. But if we're really going to get there, again, with 8% of the black vote disenfranchised because they're formerly incarcerated, they, and they happen to not live in Maine or Vermont, which are the only two states where this is truly not a problem in any way, then, then we've got to, to recognize what the architects of voter suppression after the Civil War recognized, which is that the disproportionate incarceration of the black community <coughs> and voter suppression are exactly the same thing. Thank you and God bless. So I'm happy to take questions. I wonder if we would go on the panel or questions, but I've been told I can take some questions. Yes, sir. Um, it's more research to generally the impact of people with disabilities. I mean, it's certainly accessibility is obviously major. So uh, that I find you just quite interesting. Whether it be in our residences, uh, at the schools, um, uh, government buildings, uh, uh, just any facility. So that, uh, that, that's certainly a major issue as well. Uh, well how much discussion is centered around that? Yeah, the, the, uh, when it comes to voter ID, that's, that's actually a significant part of the question. We um, did a video about the impact of voter ID. One of the things that we did was, was follow a man uh, in a wheelchair who was trying to get, uh, who's severely disabled. So he actually had mobility issues with all of his limbs and was trying to get all of the, the, the documents that he needed to vote. The man has voted his entire life. Um, and the number of hours that he would have to spend filling out these forms and everything was just astro astronomical. Uh, so yes, that is absolutely part of the conversation. Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, I mean, and, and move it toward uh, politicians of any stripe that are seeking uh, greater power for corporations. 
and for wealthy people. Yeah, you know, I mean, th this is truly just, just comes down to perspective, right? And I think it really is kind of, you know, what, from what angle do you approach the elephant, right? Um, voter ID works as a way to go after um, black folks because if you're too poor to own a car, you tend not to have a driver's license, and blacks and Latinos, for instance, tend to be disproportionately poor, right? So it's disproportionately effective. Um, the uh, ex-felon disenfranchising, disenfranchising of formerly incarcerated people works the same way, right? Um, blacks are disproportionately in prison, but they're roughly, you know, there's two kind of equally large groups, blacks and whites. Whites have similar numbers to blacks in prison, but it's just a much smaller percentage. Um, and, but who's universally in prison are, are poor people, right? And that's, that's, you know, if you look at who's in prison, it gets into the 90%. Um, in most places. So the, um, the question then becomes, are poor whites part of the target or are they just acceptable collateral damage? And I think that's, that's the question. You can debate that question I think, in you know, uh, different ways. The, uh, it becomes hard because the most empowered, either way, on either side, the most empowered voters tend to be better educated, tend to be wealthier. And so voter ID, we ha have had a hard time in our first fights in many states getting people to wrap their minds around it. Because the folks that we're really trying to get focused on, you know, on this, they have a car, they have a drug. They're the same people that were watching the TV during Hurricane Katrina, saying, just get in your car and get out of town. Right? And then all of a sudden, the water was up to here, and it occurred to them that these folks who may have had enough money to own their shotgun shack didn't have enough money to do that and have a car and pay car insurance. And those were the ones who were drowning. I think you're right to, to uh, call attention to the fact that even those of us who are, who are fighting for justice in this country, oftentimes um, the ones who are most active are on the different side of a class divide that's grown hugely cavernous in our country over the last 40 years. Along with that, could you comment on you're saying that there are poor whites who are also affected, but what's the role of racism in separating the interests so that, you know, because I, I see too much of uh, poor whites thinking differently, even though they are affected just right. as much. Right, well, it's, I mean, that's, you know, it's one of those, and I don't, I haven't studied the history probably in 20 years, but it's one of those, I think fascinating rules of politics that actually we think was always the case and wasn't quite always the case, right? So when you go way back into like Virginia colonial history, you get far enough back and you hit a point where the, where the, the documented penalty for a black man having premarital sex with a white woman, which for anybody else who's seen Roots, you know, or, you know, any number of things that have occurred after that, the whole lynching, you know, anybody's f familiar with U.S. history from Roots forward, right? So is you're going to be hung in a tree, right? I mean, that's, you know, at least roots through Emma Till, right? That's sort of the thing. You're in the South, you're black, you're not married to her, you have sex with her, she's white, you're in the tree. In the earliest times in Virginia colonial history, the penalty uh, as document was frequently that you were forced to wear a white robe and stand in the courthouse door next to her. So there's, there's, there's a point when it shifts, and there are better historians than, than I in here. But the, the holy grail of you know, US politics is to get back to that time you know, before Bacon's Rebellion or what have you, when um, whites of common financial status were able to, to their kind of pure blacks, were able to find common cause and see themselves as one set of people with, with, with one common destiny. I spend, you know, I think right now the best for a couple of reasons, and this kind of goes down to conversations had in Georgia in the wake of the, of the, of the, of the Troy Davis case. Um, right now I think that what's happening actually with drug prosecutions actually is shaking up Southern politics in a way that could be, be very interesting. If you look at drug incarceration data over the last 10 years, it's two interesting things. One, the rate of incarceration for blacks is going down, and the rate for, for whites is going up. And in many parts of this country, it's the war on crystal meth, which is basically a film negative of the war on crack. It's poor white folks in trailer parks and poor black folks in projects. And those are real people. And they have parents. 
And some of them, you know, aren't in the trail you know, in, the, in the projects. They're in the kind of brick, the, the modest brick houses down the road. And their parents are in the Georgia State Legislature, and they're Republican. And so there's uh, um, there was a set of conversations we had that first it started off about we, we got in Grover Norquist and Newt Gingrich to come out and, pre, and, and endorse a report that we released last year called Misplaced Priorities about the need to uh, switch from tough on crime to smart on crime and reframe the conversation and, and go move away from incarceration for drug addicts and towards treatment. And all of it was based on a sort of rational and sort of moral. You had three kind of pillar groups inside the Tea Party. You have the uh, conservative Christians, a lot of whom who, who they or the churches are involved in prison ministry, and they truly understand the carnage of what's happening behind bars. You have the libertarians, a lot of whom use drugs recreationally. I mean, that's sort of part of the thing, being a young Ron Paul supporter, right? Like being a Jim McGovern supporter, I suspect, you know what I'm saying? It's just part of the thing, right? So a lot of them we sort of get on, like, once, sign me up, you know what I'm saying, right? Legalized drugs, sign me up. They're libertarian. And then the next group are the fiscal conservatives, who if you got the other two groups are willing to listen to the argument that set dollar for dollar, drug rehab is seven times more effective than incarceration. So we were building coalitions, and we passed, actually, our best drug reform state-by-state -state victories in recent years have been in the South, in places like... South Carolina, Mississippi, Georgia, and Texas. Texas uh, most. And, um, and then this Republican lobbyist walks up to me and says, how do you feel about the war on crystal meth? I said, well, you know, we're c concerned about it. He said, yeah, I said, because I have a bunch of rural, of, sorry, of Republican state legislators representing rural districts, and quite frankly, uh, their kids, and the kids in their neighborhood are getting swept up, and they're concerned about it. And so we have to be willing to have courageous conversations and recognize, for instance, in these conversations that we don't just have the most incarcerated black and brown folks on the planet. We have the most incarcerated white people, certainly in the West. Right. And so that's a big problem. You live in an all-white community and it's poor. You know, in certain places, you know, that's, that's a, a real problem. You feel like over-incarceration is your, is your problem, too. And we have to be willing to have those conversations. Because Newt Gingrich wasn't going to call me, but when I called him, he responded. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I am a uh, Democratic district leader mm -hmm. here in the upper Manhattan area in Washington Heights. My problem is that I walk around with a uh, voter registration form and urging people to register to vote is a major, major problem that we have. Some people will say, like, if I vote, what do I get? Um, the elected officials are a bunch of crooks. They don't care. They are not providing the services that they are uh, urged to, you know, to provide to people once they elected. And especially the younger people who we saw a great number when Obama ran. Yeah. Every, I mean, we ran out of forms. Right. And when they went to vote, the voter population never registered them or put them on the, you know, voting, you know, rolls. But it's just like the, um, the problem that I see of people know um, having that interest, that motivation to vote once they are registered. And, you know, depending on the laws that we have here, if you don't vote on the gubernatorial, uh, you know, election, you have to be registered. And that whole thing that needs to be addressed Change. and changed. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, the, the, so the lie that's stuck is that voter ID is about vote security. And the response is that really, the you know, the best way to improve vote security and expand the vote rather than contract the vote is to handle um, voter registration the same way that we handle selective service. The same way that we handle selective service. It's basically what Canada does, is what England does. Um, and you know, if war comes and they want to draft folks, they will find you wherever you are if you sign up for selective service. Our parents taught us nothing, they taught us that, right? <laughs> and, and so it should be with the vote. And so it should be with the vote. Um, so you're absolutely right. First of all, you shouldn't have to register those young people, right? They should just be registered, um, and it should travel with them um, wherever they go. Hello, how you doing? Well, thank you. Uh, my problem is, uh, you know, being a senior and the senior citizens understanding some of the states that uh, 
they want the seniors to go out and, and get proof of the age. And it's very difficult. Like in my family, my father had got sick and had to stop working. In order for him to get uh, permanent uh, disability, he had to prove his age. And it took him three years to find out exactly how old he was. Because back in those days, you know, they put it in the Bible. So I had to go all the way back down to Virginia to find out exactly how old he was. So he had to go on temporary welfare. So three years later, he finally found his age. Now they're going after the senior citizens. Now, what are they doing about it? I've heard laws about it that they're going to fight. But what are they doing about the senior citizens that really don't have a birth certificate? Right. So the, the, um, this is a bigger problem than we realize. Again, most of us who are in power positions, we have a birth certificate. We were born in a county hospital. We, you know, our country, a lot of states, is primarily rural. Not numerically, but geographically. And South Carolina, we have, uh, I think sadly the answer to the question is that it's, it's being handled sort of differently in, in, a, in a lot of places. Um, most effectively, it's very expensive. We, South Carolina, we, we have somebody who's been a sort of multi-generation member of the NAACP, Dr. Brenda Williams, she's an MD. Her husband's an MD. They have a rural medical practice. They've spent thousands of their dollars and hundreds of their hours helping their medical clients get IDs so that they can vote because their clients disproportionately were born to rural midwives who, did, who, who often who were not literate themselves and did not record their birth anywhere. Now when you see a black person from rural South Carolina and they open their mouth, you have no question where they're from. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like you have no question, you can, you know, if your ear's really good, you can tell what, what part of the state they're from. Um, but yet these folks are being forced to work with lawyers uh, to establish that they were born here, when they were born, get you know that certificate so, so that so that uh, they can vote, and the older they are, the more likely it is. I mean, we have a country where the tradition, right, was that we didn't record the births of cattle and we record the births of black folks, and you know my my you know I grew up with stories that my grandmother's birth certificate was only her birth was only recorded because her mother, who could pass for white, volunteered at the county office to record all the black births. And so, you know, that's, that's how close we are to this. And you're absolutely right. It's our parents. It's our grandparents. In some places, it's entire communities. It's people who are our, who are our age or younger where it's still a practice that folks get born and it doesn't get recorded. Yes, ma'am? I, think, think uh, I think this is the last question before the panel. Uh, hello. Uh, it's been reported um, since the Republican GOP primary season started in January that in the states that have recently passed the new voter ID laws, they're not asking for IDs at the GOP primaries. Now, my question becomes is what's going to happen if you don't ask for these IDs, although they're now the law on the books in these jurisdictions, <coughs> during the primaries for the Republicans? In other words, you're not asking Republicans to show IDs, but then in the general election, that law is gonna suddenly be invoked to obviously ask people who are not Republicans to show ID. So my question becomes is that, is there some sort of way that by virtue of the fact that IDs were not requested during this primary season, that perhaps those laws can be challenged on that level in 2012 if you did not ask for IDs in March and April and these other you know, um, I would ask that you hold that question for the panel. I think Ted and some of the others will, will be better, excuse me, Professor Shaw and some of the others will be better at uh, responding to that. What I, what I would say is this, um, in addition to the attack on voting rights, um, there is a massive effort going on right now to make partisan how polls are handled uh, across this country. Uh, there's one group called the King Street Patriots that sought to inspire the entire Tea Party movement to, to both train poll monitors who will be there to really um, intimidate voters uh, if, if past practice holds. Um, but they have a whole other part of that movement, which is about getting people to actually volunteer to be the actual official poll workers and training them. And then on top of that, we've seen laws passed in some states, for instance, that remove the requirement that you tell a voter where their actual polling place is. 
Um, so that if you're somebody there who feels like it's not in, in sort of your interest, if you will, to let a voter know where their polling place is and the voter shows up to the wrong polling place, you just, you just don't have to tell them. So this is, this is a fair, I mean, and I'll close on this, you know. The legacy of 2000 ultimately was that our two-pronged strategy uh, for pushing voters out to the polls became three-pronged. It went from registration and GOTV to registration and GOTV plus protection of the vote. The legacy of 2011 and 2012 is that it's now will be four-pronged. We will have those three, and we will have to fight voter suppression legislation every year, every year. Because the other side, until we, we finally beat them back, I mean, they're preparing to come back. And one of the reasons why I'm going around the country talking more and more about uh, ex-felon disenfranchisement is that it appears that that seems to be where they're headed next. I mean, that law in Florida, not only did they reactivate this five to seven year, but also um, you ban on formerly incarcerated people voting, but it resets every time somebody gets a new arrest, not a conviction. Thank you. I just have to say that was an extraordinary, extraordinary speech, and um, I know Mayor Dinkins would have really appreciated and really loved it, and, and we're really sorry he can't be with us this evening, but we are taping the proceedings, and I know he's going to be watching it, and um, I know he's going to be very proud. Uh, this, is, this was his idea for the conference this year. Uh, he worked really hard on preparing this, so we're all especially disappointed that he wasn't able to join us. Um, but we expect him to be back here healthy uh, and kicking next year for the conference. Um, so I just, just wanted to tell everyone that um, he's really glad that we went on with the conference this evening. and. Um, he wanted me to make sure that you all feel welcome and make sure that uh, you enjoy the reception after the conference as well, which gives me an opportunity to thank all of the students and especially Carol Banks, Mayor Dinkins' special assistant, and she is special for all the work she does in organizing this conference and, and a lot of the staff at SEPA, without whom we wouldn't be able to do this work. I also want to tell everybody that we have a voter registration desk outside, courtesy of our good friends at the City's Voter Assistance Commission, and, and I thank you so much for coming today and being here with us, and you're amazing. So I don't know if this is a first for SEPA, but I'm sure we're going to do it again. Uh, before we get into our panel, I would really just uh, like to introduce very briefly all the panelists. You have bios in your program, um, but we've really, I think, put together just an extraordinarily interesting panel tonight, and we're so glad that Ben Jealous can stay and participate in the panel discussion as well and have everybody address questions from the audience uh, after the discussion. Uh, he has an extremely extremely trying and busy schedule and I know tomorrow he is speaking at the funeral of Reverend Sharpton's mother um, but he thought this evening was important and and he came to be with us and we're really very grateful very grateful that you were able to come and uh, join us this evening it's just such an important topic it's so powerful how you speak and um, I don't want to be disheartened when we leave. I want to be optimistic, so I'm counting on our panel to set us in the right direction. I know that's a tall order. Um, 
first, it's my pleasure to introduce Fred Harris. Um, I know that a lot, a lot of you know all of the panelists today, so we're a, pretty much a homegrown group, and, and I'm going to include you in that, Eleanor, uh, whether you like it or not. Um, but Fred is the professor of political science here at Columbia and director of the Columbia University Center on African American Politics and Society. Um, his research interests have sort of covered the spectrum of American politics, political development, and, and African American politics and movements of political participation. He's published so many books and articles, I can't really even go through them all, or we would take the entire hour. But um, for those of you who or not into such light reading, something within religion in Amer African American political ac activism is really an extraordinary and important work. I can't say that about too many political scientists. <laughs> so um, I love my discipline, I love my colleagues, but we tend to write obtusely in a way that most of us really don't even want to read ourselves. Fred is not like that. He writes beautifully, he writes on important issues, and he writes accessibly. Um, he uh, has been here with, uh, he, we're with us at Columbia, and we're, you know, you're, we're really lucky you decided to come to New York. I know that uh, um, both the graduate students and the students and the faculty, as well as the community, appreciate Fred Harris's uh, presence at Columbia University. He speaks truth to power. But I guess I could say that about uh, everybody on this panel. Um, our next person on my left, Eleanor Tatum. I'm sure everybody in this room knows Eleanor, so I'll do a little brief um, biography for her. She is the publisher and editor-in-chief of the New York Amsterdam News, and for those of you who don't know, that is the oldest and largest black newspaper in the city of New York and one of the oldest ethnic papers in the country. Um, she's shown extraordinary leadership in this position since 1997, when she became actually one of the youngest publishers in the history of black press. You probably were one of the youngest publishers, period. I think I wouldn't qualify that in any way. And um, what she's done with the Amsterdam News uh, is amazing. Having to bring print press into the 21st century is nobody's easy task. She's done it, and she's uh, still here, and this press is more and more important than ever. Um, Eleanor also, I don't know how you find the time, um, produces and co-hosts a weekly segment with Reverend Al Sharpton on the nationally syndicated weekly radio talk show, Keeping It Real. Um, the only other thing I want to say about Eleanor is uh, she comes every year to do the press section of Mayor Dinkins' public policy class. She takes on Roger Ailes, God bless you, uh, in this class, who is a good friend of the mayor's. And um, one year, she actually came with her baby in tow, I have to say, and you have the cutest baby. And I say that with all due respect and knowing from cute babies. <laughs> so um, I know that's not professional of me, but <laughs> I can do what I want at this age. <laughs> Next, Dorian Warren. Um, well, Dorian is very special at Columbia. He is an assistant professor of political science, and he is an pro assistant professor at the School of International and Public Affairs. He specializes in inequality in American politics, and he's finishing up a book on Walmart now also, um, which He's managed to get himself on TV a number of times in very contentious situations. He's, you know, he does have, you know, a PhD from Yale uh, in political science, and he's been a postdoctoral scholar at, at the Harris School at the University of Chicago and, and, and at the Russell Sage Foundation. You know, a couple of little minor achievements, but my favorite one is when you go after Fred Siegel on New York One. So I'm glad you're doing it. Um, somebody's got to, and it's really very important. He's not only a, an extraordinary scholar, but he is also somebody who brings his scholarship to the community. He's an activist. He's a practitioner of public policy, and um, 
He's another person we're lucky to have here at Columbia. Um, I'm going to jump over now to Ted Shaw, who I don't know as well personally, but it really doesn't matter because everybody else in this room knows him so well. Uh, he is at Columbia Law School, where he's a, prof a professor of professional practice, teaching civil procedure and constitutional law. I wish I was at the law school to be in your class. There's probably almost nobody that I'd say that about anymore, but I really do. Um, I happen to know a, a lot of students at the law school. I'm at that age where my children have friends who are in law school. I've got a son in law school, but for some reason, he didn't think he should stay on Morningside Heights. So we'll just leave it at that. A, competitive, a competing law school, and of course everybody knows he was the president of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund from 2004 to 2008. He's argued numerous cases before the Supreme Court, including uh, Gratz v. Bollinger, um, <laughs> some kind of uh, funny, isn't it? Uh, our president of our university, the two of you here in the same, uh, in the same university. And he did graduate Columbia Law School, I have to say that, since we're cheering on our own. But uh, I know the mayor was especially uh, happy, Ted, when you decided you, you could come today. Uh, from, you know, we political scientists, he expects a lot from those of us here at SEPA. Um, but you really did go the extra mile to be with us this evening, and um, we're grateful that you could be here. And finally, of course, last but not least, Professor Rudolfo de la Garza, I like to say that, uh, the Eaton Professor of Administrative Law and Municipal Science at Columbia. I say that only because we, we all know him as Rudy, and uh, Rudy is also a very exceptional member of our faculty. I know I'm saying all these really uh, special things about everyone on the panel, but I can't help it. It's all true, and Rudy is just another one of the faculty here who uh, we've managed to get in one place who not only is an exceptional academic but also who has worked closely with undergraduates and graduate students, um, really mentoring students, and really feels a responsibility to be involved in public policy issues in the community. He has written and edited numerous books um, the Future of the Voting Rights Act is one of his many books, Muted Voices, Latinos, and the 2000 Election. Um, I think, you know, Rudy, the reason you're at Columbia is really to keep us all honest, and I'm sure you're going to do that uh, during the course of uh, this panel discussion. Please, everybody, welcome all of our panelists. So the way we'd like to proceed this uh, evening is I'm going to try and uh, ask each panelist a question rather than having everybody uh, lecture at you. And then I will uh, hopefully promote a dialogue among our panelists from the questions that I'm asking. Um, we haven't practiced this, so I expect uh, it'll go very well anyway because uh, my only problem will be making sure that everybody gets equal time here. I know that. So what I'd like to do is uh, begin with a question um, for Dorian. I think, you know, Dorian uh, has probably the broadest view of issues in terms of his own research background. And one of the things that struck me from Ben's talk is, you know, how we have to keep linking these contemporary situations to things that have happened in the past. And, you know, we, there was progress, ostensibly, and then we look up and we see now that um, we thought we moved forward and we're being pushed backward, no, no question about it. And I'm wondering if you could really talk to us a little bit, Dorian, about how this current uh, these current initiatives around voter suppression um, are really related to some of the historical trends, and if you can help us see our way um, out of it, that would also be a useful way to take us into the next round of questions. Thank you, Esther. No pressure. <laughs> Go first. First, let me 
also say thank you to Ben Jealous, who instead of being in Florida today for the range of events happening around Trayvon Martin, chose to be with us this evening. So thank you, Ben. And also to say thank you to Ted Shaw, Professor Shaw, for being with us in light of um, the passing, the sudden passing of John Payton, the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And as you know, Professor Shaw did amazing work as head of the uh, as head of LDF, as did Mr. Payton. So we, he'll truly be missed. And thanks for all your help in rounding up all the LDF lawyers and keeping the family together. So the question about and, and Ben Jealous hinted at this a little bit, but the voting suppression efforts should not only be seen as as tied to incarceration, but it should be seen as tied to a range of activities that are happening in the states over the last two to three years. So that includes the attack on public sector unions and collective bargaining rights. That includes the uh, anti-abortion measures in many states. That includes the racial profiling immigra uh, measures targeted at immigration like in targeted at immigrants like in Arizona. We can look at all of these, call them backlash policies, and say they're related by identifying a core organization that promotes all of these things together, and that's ALEC, the, uh, help me out here, American Legislative Exchange Council, funded by the Koch brothers who we've been hearing a lot about in the media the last few years, although I don't like conspiracy theories, so it's, there's much broader support than just the Koch brothers. But these are a range of policies promoted by this and many other organizations to take us back 30, if not 60 years. And so we have to see voter suppression as part and parcel of these, these broad range of policies. The second thing to say historically is that efforts at voter suppression have always been linked to fundamental issues around redistribution and social justice. Because the threat of democracy is that if you have middle class, working class, and poor people who outnumber advantage elites, then they'll use the one weapon that's equal, the vote, to demand fairer distributions of wealth, of income, racial justice, gender justice, a range of policies. And so it's no surprise that there's an attack on the one aspect of democracy that is supposed to be equal to all of us. That there's, been a, there's an attack now, that there's been an attack historically on suppressing the right to vote. So Fred, if you could pick up on, on uh, Dorian's point on the relationship between what's going on now in voter suppression and some of the landscape issues around the Voting Rights Act and redistricting that you've done your work on, um, how do you see this connecting, uh, especially as it relates to majority minority districts in 2012? Right. Um, also, I want to uh, And th feel free to comment on the Dorian's point. Oh, sure. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone for coming out and our uh, special guest, uh, President um, Ben uh, Jealous of the NAACP. Um, that's, a, that's a really big question. Um, I, I'm one of those uh, historically conscious political scientists, so I'm pretty much a, a student of history, and I try to emphasize that in my seminars. And so, you know, when I think of of, of these schemes that are coming in to deprive um, African Americans, minorities, and quite frankly, also poor whites, you really have to go back, um, back into the 19th century, um, looking at particularly what happened in the transition from slavery to freedom. Even in those first years where um, African Americans are finally um, gaining some right, um, where s southern states are being um, uh, brought it back into the Union, one of the first things that the new regime comes up with are, is something called the Black Codes, right? Um, these are mechanisms that are used to police ex-slaves, um, sometimes racially explicit, other times not, um, based on um, sort of petty uh, crimes, what, what happened where people would be arrested or sent back to plantations um, to work. 
Um, and even where you see the emergence of, of, um, uh, of, 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 of voter rights uh, through the passage of the 15th Amendment, greater political empowerment, where black people are elected to local offices, um, um, to US Congress in places like South Carolina um, and in other su southern states, um, you see the gradual erosion of, of, of this power through mechanisms to suppress the vote. Some of this took place out of, of things like called the so-called grandfather clause, for instance, where if your you know, grandfather voted before the Civil War, you would have the right to vote too. Not racially explicit, but has racial consequences, right? And so this has sort of ebbed and flowed throughout the 20th century. Um, you know, Ben uh, uh, Jealous has al already talked about uh, what happened in Florida in 2000. So every four years, right, you can almost time it, right? It's an election year. There are these voter validation or suppression mechanisms. What's interesting is that there are new mechanisms that are being developed, right? Um, and so, um, so this is something that, you know, uh, that we have to really uh, keep a focus on. Now, actually, I, I wanted to, I thought you were going to prompt me for something else. I hope I'm not talking too long. Um, what I really want to talk about, because we're talking about voter suppression, but it, it's also a process that happens every 10 years called redistricting, mm -hmm. right? And that's something that's, that's increasingly becoming um, a concern for minority voters. There are new demographic changes that are happening in minority communities that involve immigration, uh, that involve gentrification, that involve issues like migration, particularly of, the, of, of, of blacks, particularly from the Northeast and the Midwest to the South, right? So what I think we have to really begin to think about are the consequences of these demographic shifts, what it means for redistricting, what it means for minority um, engagement, and also place, uh, again, the importance of developing multiracial coalitions, not so much around issues of what congressional districts or legislative districts look like, but more importantly, what are the most important issues that are affect those communities, like housing, like the criminal justice system, all these things that are important, um, whether there is an election or, or not an election. Um, that, that really kind of leads us into the area of expertise that Rudy de la Garza, um, I think, has among many others. But this whole issue of coalition formation and how that will be important in, in dealing with the problem of voter suppression, but also more broadly, um, what's, what will be the African-American-Latino relationship um, on this issue of voter suppression. Are they collaborating? Um, I mean, I'm gonna ask Eleanor about media coverage of this issue in a moment, but um, I haven't sensed uh, enormous collaborative e effort here across the Latino African American uh, community on this issue. The, thanks for, for the opportunity to be here. One of the things that I'm experiencing right now is an incredible depression, like, as you said before, there was a sense that we'd won many of these battles and they were over. I did a lot of expert uh, witness work in the South for black groups and we kind of thought we were over and we were just fighting rear guard actions, little towns that were resisting. and. That isn't true now. Something else is happening. But here I want to take, uh, I want to do two things. First is rather than talk about uh, efforts at voter suppression, I think it make, might make more sense to recognize the extent to which the original racial regime of the United States has never really changed. There were whites controlling the system beginning, and there's been efforts to penetrate it. Power doesn't yield automatically. So what we're calling now new efforts to suppress voters, it's, there's always been mechanisms 
with occasional bright lights when you're overcoming them. But that stuff's always been there one way or another. The Voting Rights Act gave us a momentary hope, gave me a momentary hope. But there we had a dilemma, and I'll say, I just mentioned this very early on, the coalition between blacks and Latinos uh, was not very strong. Recall that early on, the, v, the NAACP opposed the minority uh, language provisions. They did not want Latinos to get the same rights on the grounds, understandably. This, we fought this, why are you guys getting it? And so the, over time, we overcame, Latinos overcame that re resistance, and there's been elite coalitions, uh, and some ground, groundwork uh, coalition building. But the notion now that we've got is, and it was really interesting to hear the conversation, and I completely agree with everything that, that you said, but it was a black conversation. It was a black conversation. I don't, I'm not sure how the Latino conversation fits in. It strikes me, I may be wrong here, that other than the prisoner disenfranchisement, it's easier for blacks to make valid their claims as Americans and are less automatically suspect than will be the great majority of Latinos who have to prove themselves in a different way. My father was named Esteban de la Garza, didn't speak English very well, and if he went up to vote, he might talk in a way that a foreigner would talk. Well, now, that kills it. That would, that would kill it. So I don't, I don't know how that's going to play out, and I'd be interested in, I mean, that's a different dimension to this problem, and I, I'd be interested in hearing from those of you who are involved on the black side about how you think about that issue, that distinction. You, you know, Professor I'm, Dillick, I'm going to ask uh, you, Ben, to... <coughs> Jump in here. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. I, we we get a little head nod thing. Waiting, I thought that I got anything it. like that, which is okay. <laughs> Thank you. you know, the the um, yeah, this was a very black conversation because it was it was really rooted in history coming out of the Civil War. Um, if we were having a conversation in the context of a rally or a community event these days, we usually cut short a lot of the historical conversation and get right down to what's going on right now. And what's very much happening right now is that there is an attempt to hold off the future. Right? I mean, no one can deny what happened in 2008. Voters of color voted in the highest numbers ever. It was the most diverse, largest electorate we've ever seen for any president in this country. Uh, I mean, as far as total votes cast. And for any presidential election. And some folks looked at that and said, oh, yes. And some folks look and say, oh, no, no. And so the struggle uh, that we've been engaged in is the folks who said, oh, no, trying to delay the mathematics that are coming at them and seem to be accelerating, right? Because a couple of years ago, we said this country is going to be majority minority, um, majority people of color and a nation of minorities. And a date, I think, in the last 10 years has moved up 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. And so... You know, some interesting things, you know, kind of views from the ground as you travel around the country. Our membership gets it. I spent a long, a lot of time these days talking about a speech Frederick Douglass gave in just after the Civil War in the fight against the Chinese Exclusion Act called Our Composite Nationality. Mm -hmm. And he says in that speech uh, a couple of important things. One, he says, if you believe majorities matter, and I believe they do, then it should matter that the world is four-fifths colored and only one-fifth white. And I'll come back to why that's important in a second. And the other thing he says is that every country has a destiny that is largely defined by its uh, character, which is defined by its highest ideals and influenced by its geography. And we have a very unique geography because we're bordered by two oceans that link us to the rest of the world and two nations, uh, very different um, 
colors, Canada and Mexico. Well, that's important for a couple of reasons, because that's black leadership 150 years ago coming out against what the equivalent of HB 56 today, saying we don't have an interest in this, and saying that the, this nation's destiny is to be basically what it's becoming right now, and that our interest is in accelerating that, not holding that back. Um, it's also important because it explains in part why an intellectual like W.E.B. Du Bois in 1910 would insist that we change our name from, I believe it was the National Negro Association, to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Because while most of our grandparents who stood under color signs remind those, re recall those as being synonymous with black, in actuality, the way it was used was to determine all of humanity that was not white, in the same way that Frederick Douglass had used it. Mm. 50 years before we changed our name. And that's why even though it's a fashion, whether we're black or we're African American or we're Negro or we're, you know, whatever, the, that fashion didn't change between 1909 and 1910. That was a very intentional change. Um, on the ground, you know, a few years ago, um, I decided to have fun with a crowd in front of the South Carolina governor's mansion that was out there, you know, black crowd. I got them chanting C.C. Poitier because I'm a boy from Monterey County, California. And I, when I grew up, Cesar Chavez was our local Martin Luther King, and I suspected that if, if the governor looked at his, his house or her house and saw 8,000 black people chanting in Spanish, it would scare the heck out of her. <laughs> but I come back this year, and on that, on that placard that you, know, you can suspect in the black community, these education, jobs, justice, is the issue of immigration. Mm -hmm. In South Carolina, not in Alabama, there's been a lot of groundwork done. In South Carolina, most folks are ignoring. In Alabama, the group with the numbers on the ground fighting HB 56 is the NAACP. And to your point between the, the split between elites and local folks, in places like California, except there's always, you know, in different places, there's more friction on the ground. There's been people have taken regressive measures. But when it came, for instance, to challenging the Europe only exclusion with regard, I mean, the Europe only preference for migration to this country. The NAACP was very in, in, involved in that fight right after passing the mm -hmm. Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. So there is a strain, and I, and I totally get your point. It's a more elite strain. But these days, it's right on the ground in places in, like Alabama and South Carolina. And numerically, because Latinos are 3% in Alabama and blacks are 30%, it's the NAACP who's actually out there, numerically, people on the ground in the vanguard on that issue. I want to shift gears for a moment and um, bring Eleanor into the conversation from the perspective of the press. She can take whatever perspective she wants, but it seems to me that um, there's an interesting question here about the extent to which this issue is being covered and how it's being covered by the press, which seems to me quite varied and um, not always clear about the implications of this kind of legislation, you know, that's been passed in, in dozens of states across the country. So I wanted to get your take on the varied coverage and what it, what it means and where you think it's going. Well, you know, the media has played a very, very important part in this. And it's a very scary role that it has also played in a lot of cases. And excuse my voice, I have laryngitis, so if you can't hear it's me. It's very charming. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I, and I, I must tell you, one of the major connections that I do have to, to Columbia University is that I met Ben Jealous here for the first time in the mid-90s when he was trying to convince a group of students that if you're going to take over a building, you don't have pizza and the DJ already inside. <laughs> <laughs> have some dignity. Have some dignity. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you do. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> it was a really good party, actually. Um, but when, when you look at the media today and you look at what they have actually done and the messages that they're actually putting out, and I'm not talking about the Amsterdam News here. I'm talking about the other media, the media that is perpetrating these lies, I would call them, because that's what they actually are, about what these laws are actually going to do. And yet we had the question earlier about rural whites and poor whites. And 
how they were affected and how they don't believe that they're affected. And it's that media that's out there that is, it, that is talking to them directly. And it's, you know, it's talk radio, it's Fox News that's saying that those poor whites and those rural whites are different than blacks. And so they're on that side of those that are for these voter suppression on all, and this assault on voting rights. And it's this misinformation that's out there and there is so much of it. And especially when it comes to the rural and poor whites, it's that this won't affect them, number one, and number two, it's the right thing to do because we have to stop those other folks, meaning the people of color, from actually getting where, anywhere in this country and reelecting a black president. And that's what the bottom line is on this. It's scaring people into the idea that, um, that they've got to do this because they don't want Barack Obama for another four years. And you know, it was really interesting, as uh, Professor Fuchs said, I co-host um, a segment of Reverend Sharpton's uh, show, talk show on, uh, on the radio every week. And we had a caller in the other day, and he was a white Repu well, former white Republican. He's still white, no longer a Republican. <laughs> Um, who called and said, you know, I started watching your show on MSNBC and you actually started making some sense to me. And I was thinking about the fact that I've asked questions before and I've never had real answers and you've given us answers to these questions. And so now I ask my friends who believe that Barack Obama is bad, that he's bad for this country, that he's bad for us personally, that he's bad for this, that, and the other thing. And I ask them why, and they can't answer those questions. So what we have is a whole part of the media that is telling people things that they should believe, but can't give them any facts to back it up. And so we are living in a world where it's just bits and pieces, where there's no facts behind it. And then you have the other media. You know, like, for the most part, I miss NBC these days with Rachel Maddow and Reverend Sharpton and Schultz and whatnot. And then you've got the ethnic media and the black media in particular that's been talking about these issues not just this last year, but the last decades. Since our inception, we've been fighting these issues and, and working on these issues and trying to bring it out into the forefront. And you know, it also makes me think about the whole a prison issue and redistricting and the fight that we had just here in New York to make sure that prisoners were actually counted in th where they lived and not where they were incarcerated. Because again, that was bringing more power to upstate communities instead of, and services, whereas these prisoners would be getting out one day and not having the services they need right at home. So. That's another thing that the media really did not cover a lot. I, of course, we did. And, and Ben was um, actually very helpful in covering that because he was also leading that fight in several states around the country. But in general, the media has, you know, it's a double-edged sword in this. You've got the, some media who is attacking these issues and saying that, you know, we really don't deserve any of these rights and we've got to fight every which way we can to make sure that blacks aren't able to continue to be strong. And then you've got the other media which is saying, we have to fight, we gotta continue to fight, and this is how we do it. I wanna get Ted's perspective in here, um, and then I'm gonna come back to Ben uh, to wrap up. Uh, Ted is the person who really knows, in effect, the most about the, the direct subject um, how this legislation will play out in court, what will be the short-term remedies, if any. You know, I'm wondering if you can speak to us. I mean, it is, uh, makes one somewhat pessimistic when we hear the perspectives of the social scientists and the media experts on um, where, we're, where we came from and where we're going and where we're going again. Um, and I'm really wondering, I think all of us are wondering is that are there any con critical constitutional issues that can bring a quick close to this sort of dismal chapter of our history or are we doomed to be fighting this over and over again every four years as state legislatures you know, take it upon themselves to 
uh, be more and more creative in figuring out ways to pass legislation to suppress the vote. And you can riff on that in any way you choose. Thank you. <clears throat> let, me, um, uh, let me answer that question first, and then I want to, um, if I may, go back to uh, the issue that uh, Professor De La Garza put on the table. Um, the short answer to the question is uh, that the Supreme Court, when it decided Crawford versus Indiana, um, closed the door as long as this court is the court that we have uh, to a real effective attack on these voter suppression methods. It doesn't mean that uh, anything goes, but um, what happened in Indiana was both shameless and shameful. And this Supreme Court, uh, the Roberts Court, uh, acted as if um, uh, there was uh, an issue here that we, that the record showed didn't exist. Um, the very political Supreme Court. And I don't think it's one that we can look to for help uh, on this issue right now. <coughs> Having said all that, what it really underscores is the importance of political activism um, and um, the importance of the election that is before us. Uh, I've been a litigator for more than three decades now, and I've come to believe very deeply that we have to understand the role of litigation is important. Um, uh, it's tactically crucial at times. Uh, but if people think that we're going to have uh, litigation and um, uh, in this Supreme Court uh, a judicial uh, cutting edge when it comes to issues of justice along lines of race and ethnicity, I think that they're badly mistaken. In the absence of uh, political empowerment, uh, activism, uh, this isn't going to change. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is that we are uh, one vote short or shy of what could be a dramatic change uh, in um, uh, the Supreme Court. And uh, an election uh, like the one that's before us could impact uh, that outcome. I realize most people expect that the next seat to change on the Supreme Court is not going to be one of the conservatives. That probably is right, but one never knows. That's right. You know, if you've been around the block long <laughs> enough, you know that right. there's always the unexpected. Uh, so um, uh, elections count. They're important. And, uh, you know, the Supreme Court ultimately, I think, uh, uh, will be impacted by these elections. There's always this question about whether the Supreme Court follows the elections or the elections follow the, you know, the court, um, and both happens. I mean, we have a Supreme Court a few years ago that um, uh, selected the president, um, so uh, it's powerfully important. Like and at the same that. time, I think we have um, a, uh, a court that is impacted by uh, the election of a president. Uh, so. Uh, I hope that, that answers that question. Let me go back to the question or the issue that Professor De La Garza put on the table because I have a little bit of a different take and I don't want to be misunderstood on this. Um, uh, and my little bit of a different take is this, that um, uh, I am, uh, and I think, uh, I hope all of us are many things. We believe and we support many things and many causes. Um, and uh, I am deeply concerned about the issue of economic inequality in this country, which I think is going to be the most important question of the 21st century, not only here but around the world, if it isn't already. Uh, you know, we think about what W.B. Du Bois said with respect to the question of the color line at the beginning of the 20th century, and we can paraphrase that at the beginning of the 21st century. That does not mean that the question of the color line has gone away, but uh, I believe deeply in um, uh, the need to address the problem of the uh, of, of economic inequality. Um, I believe that the demographics of this country, uh, not I believe, I know that the demographics of this country are changing profoundly. Uh, African Americans uh, are basically flatlining with respect to uh, percentages of the corporate uh, of, of the. Uh, of the country uh, in population and will remain at about 12%, right on up through and beyond the middle of the 
first century. That's not true for Latinos uh, in this country. Uh, Latinos will continue to grow. There's no way uh, that that's not going to happen <coughs> in population, if only for self-interest. Uh, if it was only selfishness, African Americans have to engage in coalition politics with Latinos and, and all other groups. Um, uh, it is necessary, but it's also the right thing to do. Um, so I believe that very deeply, and I've spent a good chunk of my legal career uh, representing uh, not only the interests of African Americans, but thinking about and at times representing the interests of other people of color, including primarily Latinos. Um, uh, and at times working on behalf of uh, poor white folks. All of that is a preface to say this, though. Uh, I believe unapologetically, <coughs> unabashedly, um, and without um, uh, any reservation uh, that uh, the issue uh, and the issues with respect to African Americans in this country along the color line for black folks remain uh, a, a, a vitally important issue. And the dominant paradigm that informs all our discourse, whether we're talking about color blindness, uh, or rather whether we're talking about voter suppression, whether we're talking about higher education, this is the record in the Fisher case that's before the Supreme Court right now, or some of the record, uh, whether we're talking about um, uh, criminal justice, uh, whether we're talking about health care, see, go online and look at the uh, piece that was on NPR last week about what really was underlying a lot of opposition to health care, it was race, or is race. Um, uh, you know, but a lot of this is still, uh, still emanates from the old divide, the longest, oldest divide in this country, that is the black-white divide that informed our country at the beginning was our original sin, slavery. Uh, it doesn't mean there's a hierarchy of, of uh, of, um, of victimization status, that's absurd. Uh, but the dominant paradigm is colorblindness now, and it's not, and it's particularly driven at black folks, uh, I believe. Um, not to talk about race, I mean, what happened in Trayvon Martin, uh, Martin's case in Florida, there are a lot of folks who have, uh, I don't know where they get it from, but they have the gall to suggest that this is not about race. The natural reaction is, uh, when it comes to race, and particularly African Americans, to push back immediately. Whatever's going on, whatever the facts are, uh, people jump immediately and say, this isn't about race. It's about everything else but race. Um, and so the reality is that we still have, uh, I believe, a deep, deep racial divide, and most of the heat is felt along the black-white divide, and that remains so today. Uh, now. That does not mean, as I say, there's a victimization status. It doesn't mean that there's a, another set of, that there is not another set of problems with respect to immigration and Latinos, and in fact, it's not racism directed at Latinos. And not only from white folks, you know, from within the African American community at times, and vice versa, uh, and other communities. But what I'm saying, what I'm trying to underscore, and I hope that I've said it well enough, is that I, for one, refuse to let go of the need to represent the interests of African Americans clearly and unapologetically uh, in this country. Before I ask Ben to <clears throat> for some final thoughts, I thought I would just ask our panelists to just briefly comment now, and I mean briefly because there is a reception waiting and I've promised everybody we would get them to the reception by eight, um, on the, uh, the thoughts of your pal fellow panelists. So uh, why don't we uh, start with Fred? Um, or how, well, we um, can. I'm, you called it. So. I did. Uh, I, I think um, this discussion, uh, particularly around coalitions, um, particularly between Latinos and African Americans, is one that's going to really have to be um, talked in detail about because of the demographic changes that are occurring. I mean, I absolutely um, agree with Ted's assessment. I think foundationally, the divide is still, when we talk about race, when we say race in this country between black and white, and that's really in many ways linked to um, the country's historical development. I mean, I often think about this concept called, called the house that race built, right? That, you know, even there, that the house has changed, that you put new paint on it, there's a new roof. The foundations are pretty much still the same. Um, and they reverberate o over time. Um, 
And so, you know, I just I, I just want to say that I think Rudy did put the, that issue on the table, uh, and I think it's going to be important not only elites on the elite level because, as we know, for decades there's been. Um, uh, coalitions on the elite level between members of the Congressional Black Caucus, Latino Caucus. I think they even now have now uh, a caucus that combine both, um, and they work uh, together. Um, and of course, there are the Legal Defense Fund, Mexican Americans, and um, the other uh, defense funds that have, uh, you know, mobilized around these issues um, around voter rights. Uh, but again, I think there needs to be the shift toward issues particularly around issues like criminal justice, um, because it, again, it disproportionately affects black people, you know, black men in, in particular. You know, I have a four-year-old son, right, um, and we live in Morningside Heights. Right now, people think he's cute, you know, adorable, but once he becomes tall, um, he's no longer gonna be perceived as a cute kid, but as a threat. Uh, and if he goes out of Morningside Heights and attends a public school, um, he'll probably get regularly uh, stopped and frisked. So you know, I so we recognize these issues, and these issues again are just n doesn't affect you know African Americans, and they affect Latinos as well. So I'll end there. Um, Rudy, some brief brief thoughts. Yeah, I, in my writing, in many public lectures, I have always said, I say it again. The, the Latino experience cannot compare in intensity, cruelty, price with the black experience. There is no doubt about that. Having said that, I absolutely believe that. There is no comparison. Having said that, the question is still the why there's got to be more done together. There absolutely has to be more done together. There are, there's a small number of Latinos. I was, a Chic I was in the Chicano movement all that back when. All right? When people refuse to discuss that this way, hopefully we are beyond that. It's got to be together and to say, as I just said, in a public meeting with Latinos, whether I say it, you say it, or Fred says it, will blow up a Latino meeting. It'll blow it to hell and you'll set things back months or years. Wow, all right. Eleanor, you can comment on anything. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm going to reference something that my father used to quote, and unfortunately, I, I don't remember it perfectly, but I can give you the essence of it. And I believe it was a, a man of the cloth who, during World War II, said, first they came for the gypsies, and I was not a gypsy, so I did not stand up. Then they came for the blacks. I was not a black, I did not stand up. Then they came for this group and that group and that group. But then when they came for me, there was nobody left to stand up. And so, right, if we don't work together, there will be nobody left standing. And it's getting crucial. And it has been crucial, but I think we're just seeing it now from everything to this assault on voting rights to what happened to Trevon. You know, I gotta tell you, I have a 17-month-old daughter, and when I found out I was having a girl, I was so happy, because I was afraid to raise a black boy in this city. Now, when you have to think about things like that before a child is even born, we really have some things that we have to work out. Dorian. <laughs> Take a breath. There is one other historical continuity I want to point out, and that is the historic clash between the role of the federal government and state governments. The historic clash between states' rights and the federal intervention. And that clash is racially founded. It's founded on the basis of our racial hierarchy. So 
the slavery question was a question about states' rights versus federal intervention. The Jim Crow question was a question about states' rights versus federal intervention. And today, race is still at the core of states' rights claims, but it's not exclusively about race. So today, states' rights is being used to promote a range of socially unjust policies around immigration. Mm -hmm. If you look at Arizona and Alabama, around women's rights and reproductive freedom in states all across the country, around the issue of marriage equality for lesbian and gay folks. So this historic tension, this historic clash between states' rights and federal intervention is partly at the heart of this bigger debate that we're having. Who has the right to intervene? Do states, mostly southern states, have the right to set their own policy vis-a-vis -vis the federal government, especially when the federal government is on the side of people of color or women, especially embodied as, with a black president? Ben, I'm going to ask you for some final thoughts. You know, I, I think that the, you gave a challenge, Professor Fuchs, was to leave you with a sense of hope. I'm not quite sure that we've met it. I'm gonna try, <laughs> try to push us. And I'm not promising we will in my it's comments, but I will, I will try to push us a little bit further. Mm -hmm. Last week I landed this town in, in Sanford, Florida. Like I said, more tense than any town I've ever seen in my life. And by the end of the week, like I said, DOJ had opened an investigation, and the state's attorney had set a date certain, and uh, new, the governor had appointed a new state's attorney, and the police chief had been forced aside. But the most hopeful thing I saw was a white Southern Republican governor welcome the DOJ to his town and vote to fire the police chief, at the, at, um, or vote no confidence in the chief um, at the urging of the local black community. Um, that's a sign of change. Right, <laughs> and amen to that. Um, what we've learned from history, you know, what you learn when you go back and you read the words of Frederick Douglass and you reflect on him and his screed against the Chinese Exclusion Act, you're fighting HB 56 in Alabama, is that the future comes. The only thing that the reactionaries can do is delay it, but it's irrepressible and it comes. The, the other thing is I would say this, that when you looked, when I, as I reflected in the fight with the Tea Party, and which had its own seeds of hope. We passed 12 progressive criminal justice reforms in Texas last year, Texas announcing it's shutting down its first prison ever, and we did it with the Tea Party. It's a whole other conversation. Wow. But when I, when I look at the worst racial elements of the Tea Party, and the worst part of that experience in 2009, 2010, they're acting exactly like people at the end of their political rope should act. Right? Right. I mean, you know, I was told once in Mississippi, two things in Mississippi, well, I'll skip one, but one thing I was told in Mississippi was, you, know, you, you don't just judge a man by his friends, you judge a man by his enemies. Well, you don't just judge the future by who's welcoming it, you, you judge it by the desperation of those who are opposing it and the lengths that they'll go to. And as the lengths that, that they go to get more and more extreme, it means it's closer and closer. So I'll leave you with that final thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, thank you to this extraordinary panel. And thank you especially to Ben Jealous for coming and keynoting today. I just want to invite everybody to a reception in honor of Ben Jealous at the request of Mayor Dinkins. Thank you so much.